Oh, yeah. Blue? Tinge of green. We are live. Blair oh. is multicolored. Oh, with flashing lights. There is what? There is okay. some kind of electronic illumination magic happening over at the Blair, the Blairla house. <sighs> <laughs> well, we are here like this yes you can do you you choose it is your home studio you can be whatever <laughs> color yeah. you dream to be this evening <sighs> welcome everyone this is the live broadcast of the this week in science podcast we hope that you're ready for a good show full of the science we're here to talk about the science with all of you and you know how it goes this is the live thing that's happening right now. Everybody watching on YouTube or Facebook or Twitch. No, we rehearsed like, this, right? Ah, yeah. It's like, <laughs> oh, wait. Oh, they what made a mistake. Or, oh, they said, um, or, uh, bleh. And that's true. Edit time? It that's may crazy. get edited for the podcast. Um, like, you won't hear any of this in the podcast. What we're saying right now it appears nowhere on out. the podcast. Oh, off this the is podcast. The cutting this room is, floor. Yeah, but then again, there's the whole the part, part that was before this happening now, which, which was delay. a combination of face spiders? No, space spiders. Okay. And that was totally fine. Yeah. It's, uh, sometimes you walk into the, the, the preamble to the show and nothing makes sense that it's normal. And sometimes you walk into the show and nothing makes sense. But I hope that we can help you make sense of the science news this week with a few fun stories and some good discussion. And yeah, a lot of a lot of a lot of enjoyment of the science together. Okay, we're ready for the show. We're ready to do it. Yum. Mm -hmm. yeah, this is the preamble to the preamble. Yes. That later turns it into happen. a show. Indeed it is. <sighs> and we will begin this show in a countdown of three, two, this is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 854, recorded on Wednesday, December 8th, 2021. What time does science say to eat? Hey there, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on the show, we will fill your head with food, sex, and unconfirmable results. But first. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. You can only go so far in this world before you find yourself at a door. You unlock this door with the key of education. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound reasoning. A dimension of insights. A dimension of mindful observation. A place to contemplate the vastness of space and the timelessness of infinity. You are now traveling through a wondrous land, both science and substance, of things and ideas, whose boundaries are that of imagination. Signpost up ahead. You've just crossed over into This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. Kiki and Blair. And a good science to you too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back again to talk about the science. We have science stories. Justin, welcome back. Thank you. We hope that you are having a lovely honeymoon. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And that you got many well wishes. And congratulations. Uh -huh. Yeah, people were like, uh, were like, hey, way to finally stop being single all the time. There That's you pretty, go. Yeah. Great, way yeah. to do it. You yeah. figured it out. They were like, about time, mostly, was the <laughs> response. Oh, people, people, people. It's about time for the science, though. 
I have stories about pollution correlations, primate cavities, and proteins to fight aging. Ooh, those are yeah. the good kind. They're the good kind. Uh, what do I got? What, what do, do I have, got? Justin? Do I... Ah, I got somewhere in here I wrote down a list. Okay, I've got uh, Just Good News, uh, Melting Ice Edition. Oh, yay. Yeah. Uh, oh. I have Unrepeatable Science Experiments. Uh, unreproducible. Bare Feet of Tanzania. And why every prison should be a college. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Blair, what is in the Animal Corner? Oh, yes, the Animal Corner. Um, mm -hmm. I have a story about bird feathers and another about orbiting spiders. And then outside of the corner, I have a story about smoked salmon, uh, the food, and also uh, chewing gum for COVID. Wow. Hmm. And that's not like a fundraiser where it's like, no. how many pieces of chewing gum can you stuff in your mouth to make money for? No, or no, not violent. Long, can you chew the same gum. piece of gum? Yeah. Yes. Oh, is this going to be the, like all the un, uh, the previously chewed gum, like on banisters, <laughs> under tables and on the subways? Whatever. Oh, Those yeah. To boost your immune system. Full of COVID. For sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, no. Don't touch it. Any, don't touch it. It's evil. No, just wait till the COVID update. Well, I'll tell you all about it. Okay. Oh my gosh, it's terrifying. As we jump into the show, because that COVID update is coming in a little bit, as are all those stories, I do want to remind you that if you are not yet subscribed to the Twist podcast, you can find This Week in Science on just about every podcast platform out there. We are also on YouTube and on Facebook and on Twitch for live streamed episodes. And you can find us as Twist Science on Instagram, on Twitch, and on Twitter. We're out there. We're doing things, spreading the science. We hope that you follow. Now, let's see if you can follow us down this winding trail of science breadcrumbs. Okay, let's talk about pollution correlations. Well, really, pollution and sex. Gender? Pollution. No, sex. <laughs> sex. Pollution and the sex of children when they are born. Okay. Uh, a study out this week in the PLOS Computational Sciences has found a connection, or computational biology, excuse me, um, has found a connection between pollution levels and changes in the birth sex ratio. Hmm. Um, this is just in a, humans. In humans, they looked at a, a oh, 150 goodness. million people in the United States over eight years, mm. 9 million people in Sweden over 30 years. And we're trying to figure out what factors might be involved in the shifting sex ratios of uh, males to females in human babies. Uh, because there is, you know, even odds that you're going to have the XY or the XX chromosomes. There are other odds in there for other determinations. But for a general averaging, it's pretty much even odds that you're going to have males or females. And so researchers have been trying to figure out all these many societal biological, environmental issue, uh, factors that could potentially be shifting the predominance to males over females because uh, they have seen a larger number of males being born than females over the years. So why is it happening? Why is it slightly skewed in that direction? Well, this massive look at this massive collection of data um, just found a whole bunch of correlations and they're really just trying to pull statistical significance out of this massive collection of data. And it could be said that they are, that they were digging for trends, that they were trend hunting. Uh, it's not really P hacking, but this could be on the level of similarity to some of the, uh, the large GWAS, the, 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 the genome wide, um, surveys that find statistical significance between 
different genes and uh, and biological factors that we've discovered are not really as uh, as as amazing as we thought they were because they were just kind of digging in these big big piles of data for connections. So that said, they found connections between uh, aluminum, chromium, mercury, uh, and they also, and these are airborne and waterborne pollutants. They also found an opposite correlation with higher levels of lead in soil. So more lead in the soil led to fewer male babies being born. But then they also looked at stressful events. Hurricane Katrina didn't have any effect on the sex ratios, but the Virginia Tech's shooting in the United States uh, did. It affected the um, the numbers of males versus females. So you can look at some of these correlations and go, why would the, the you know, the Virginia Tech shooting versus Hurricane Katrina? And what, what are you talking about? And how is that going to have an effect? And there are a lot of things in there that there are correlational trends that it's like, yeah, it probably isn't anything at all. And thank goodness the researchers do say these are correlations, but maybe they point to a direction where real research should be done. Nope. <laughs> yeah, this one's tough for me. I think that it's in the life of a human outside of a lab, you can't, how can you possibly narrow this down to one thing? Mm -hmm. I don't think you can. Yeah. I mean, so maybe these are, you know, similar to the GWAS, to those gen genomic analyses and correlations. Is, uh, maybe they have a, like a, a small percentage influence. Maybe they have a small, it's pushing yeah. things over the edge just a little bit. But yeah, well, so the they the need to is... study cells. They need to study mechanisms. They need to be looking deeper into it. But yeah, this was like digging in a mud puddle and going, oh, I found dirt at the bottom. Yeah. So mechanism and all that stuff does come later. And you got to start with a correlative. You have to have a thing that makes you start zeroing in on something in the, in the first place. And so correlative evidence for things or correlative associations of things is a great place to start looking for these things like the lead in the soil versus the uh you know birth rate of uh, males versus females is something that might be interesting enough to look into um but it i think they do a good job in a weird way of showing the limits of of relying on that by using the hurricane uh it affected a huge swath of uh, an entire state of people no effect no and then uh, the umpteenth shooting at a school that year alone having this dramatic effect shows you that, like, well, you could have been possibly like, what was the, you know, what was the topic on the uh, the uh, John Oliver show uh, mm -hmm. this week? And how exactly. did that affect? And how did that affect the birth rate? Yeah. Oh, well, you know, he talked about this uh, subject, which is controversial, and the birth rate went this way. And the next week, it was more jokes. And so they went the other way. Uh, so it shows the limits of using correlative at the same time. I think so. Yeah. That's why That's why when you do these things, they have to be, there has to be a level of previous knowledge uh, brought to bear. So something like an exposure to uh, a heavy metal in the soil might be something you might know, have to say, hey, we've seen different effects in other species with this. Now we're looking at the correlative between where this pollution exists and birth rates in humans, and we found a signal that we can then go and investigate versus just blanket looking for like for those uh, p-value hacking values or whatever, looking for hits. Uh, you you start to create them without previous knowledge, and then that that's when they become less, I think, useful. Yeah, but I think it's important for people to understand when they look at some of the headlines. Like they're probably this week seeing headlines that say sex ratios at birth linked to pollutants. Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, which ones? How's it? How does that work? What's going on? Oh, pollution, bad. Yes, pollution is bad. It's not helpful for many things. But this, the word linked usually means there's a correlation. It doesn't usually imply some sort of mechanism or proof. And so it's a good way to uh, to critically 
view the headlines that you might look past before you go, oh, right, I know this. No. Yeah. Take, take I a, think the word linked is I think the word linked is used inappropriately, actually. I would say the fact that they're saying it's linked uh, is inappropriate. Right. Is I'm, it? I, yeah. It's just it's it's correlated. It's the, they found some things that look like, oh, they might go together. Yeah. Anyway, be on your lookout when you're looking out there at those headlines, everyone. Justin, what do you want to tell us about right now? Oh, uh, I've got just good news this week. Mm. Yeah, uh, that's the uh, new segment. Uh, it's designed to put a good science news story in your head, despite the subject matter maybe being something that's not as uh, ideally suited for positive information, things that you would want to have uh, be thinking about. Just good news, melting ice edition. Simon Fraser University researchers looking into retreating glaciers in North America have found that lots of freshwater glaciers could produce more than 6,000 kilometers of potential new Pacific salmon habitat by the year 2100. So there's uh, some 46,000 glaciers just between southern British Columbia and south central Alaska, and they're melting uh, rather rapidly, it seems. Underneath them is bedrock. And they will, uh, as these melts take place, they're going to create new tributaries, new rivers, new uh, new lake areas, and they're going to create some a lot of salmon-friendly landscapes. So these are landscapes that are going to have water, fresh water, uh, with access to the ocean. So the salmon are going to be able to find it, swim up there, lay eggs, reproduce, uh, all the conditions they need for a salmon colony. Uh, this is quoting voice of uh, Pittman, who's one of the researchers involved in looking at all this. It's a common misconception that all salmon return home to the streams they were born in. Most do, but many individuals will stray, migrating into new streams to spawn. And if conditions are favorable, the population can increase rapidly. So they have another example of something called the Stonefly Creek. Uh, in Glacier Bay, Alaska, there were some glaciers that retreated back in the 70s, and these uh, salmon, pink salmon, moved in uh, to the retreated area and, beca and became a spawning ground. So, potential uh, good news for salmon habitats in some areas where there used to be glaciers. In other ice melting news, a new technique designed, developed by McMaster University in Canada uh samples dna from ice core permafrost which is good news because there is still permafrost to use this technology on at the moment although rapidly melting the technology has showed up uh just in time they published in nature communications the uh creatures present a thirty thousand year dna record of past environments from cored permafrost sediments extracted from the Klondike region in the Yukon. Researchers use DNA capture enrichment technology to observe fluctuating animal and plant communities at different time points. Very notably, they found the presence of both woolly mammoth and North American horses until as recently as 5,000 years ago. So that's that's a lot, uh, a lot more recently than we thought. Yeah, it's about five, six thousand years uh, more current. Yeah, uh, than than our than our last run. Because uh, uh, that's uh, around that eleven thousand year time point is a bit of a bottleneck. It's, I think when we lose the saber tooth, uh, saber tooth tiger, and some other uh, large, large fauna in North America. And it's not the horses and the mammoth went away too, but no, mammoth and horses. So uh, this is a quoting, who is this here? We uh, This is Tyler Murchie, who's a postdoctoral researcher at McMaster's Department of Anthropology and a lead author of the study. Now that we have these technologies, we realize how much life history information is stored in the permafrost. The amount of genetic data in permafrost is quite enormous and really shows uh, really allows for a scale of ecosystem and evolutionary reconstruction 
that is unparalleled with other methods to date, which is really amazing if you think about it. Like all of the all of the time we spend uh, fossil hunting, we've got to find a thing that happens to be preserved well enough and aired enough or buried enough uh, situation for us to even find the evidence of it. Here's permafrost. Here's frozen soil that's been there for 30,000 years. And they're able to use this, this technique to gather DNA out of the layers of the frozen soil and reconstruct from whence it had come. Yeah. And I've, I'm thinking, I mean, we've talked so much on the show about, you know, oh, ancient bacteria or fungi that could be uh, thawed and potentially come back spores that could once again become active and uh, and and join the modern world that and not have been seen for for thousands of years. If mm -hmm. if that's possible, then why wouldn't DNA be yeah. just this DNA, these records of these other animals? That's a, I, you know, you take one and one, and sometimes you don't put it together to make two. You need you need you need the scientists to lead you there. <laughs> and this is uh, Ross McPhee, the American Museum of Natural History co-author, says uh, the horse that lived in the Yukon 5,000 years ago is directly related to the horse species we have today. Biologically, this makes the horse a native North American mammal, and it should be treated as such. So this is sort of the interesting thing, because we think of the horse as being introduced to North America. Yeah. But the horse that was introduced to North America was in North America. Not that long ago, 5,000 years ago. Well, there's different and, types of horses on different continents, right? So right. I think that's the thing. No. That's the other thing. That's not quite, quite true. So... <laughs> The horses that were that that propagated uh, in Asia, you know, with the you know the Mongolian hordes, the, the ho first horse riders, like they were like really like dedicated horse riding uh, people. Those horses used to move back and forth from North America to to Northeast Asia when that whenever the, when the, the, there was. There were grasslands between the two. The Bering Strait was grasslands for a tremendous amount of time. And horses would move back and forth, and they'd get stuck on one side of the other. And then they'd be, they would freeze again, and they'd be able to wander back and forth again. So, so this idea that we, we have horses on such disparate parts of the planet. Actually, it's, you know, if you move the map over, those parts of the map, when you have the U.S. at one end and all of Europe is always shown on the other side of the map. And you can scooch that, that globe around and it's all connected uh, at some point. Anyway. It is. Yeah. And this is this is probably part of the a bigger conversation about native versus invasive species and right. you know, where you, uh, where did it come from and when and how fact far, far back are you talking? And yeah, you know, and, and it's, uh, at the it's ecosystem also shows that, level. Yeah, yeah, it also shows that the uh, the uh, We've had this conversation before about reintroducing the mammoth because it was 10, 11,000 years since uh, it's been in North America. Now it's only 5,000 years. Only 5,000? Getting closer. That's not long. Getting right. How are, the, how are the wild horses doing in the Americas, Justin? Oh, they were actually so great. doing great so until great. the Bureau of Land Management started shooting them. Yeah, well, they're doing they're so doing well. High. That the BLM wants to get rid of them. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So how would the mammoth do? Probably great. the same. Yeah, probably, probably just do great. just yeah. great, just like bison and cattle. Okay, Blair, tell me a story. Well, I want to talk about salmon, specifically oh. Danish smoked salmon. Yum. Whoa. Yes. So uh, this is a, a study from University of Copenhagen um, looking at smoked salmon, which is extremely popular in Danish shopping markets. Always. Everyone's eating smoked salmon. And the majority of smoked salmon in uh, Denmark is sourced from Norwegian aquaculture farms. Um, conventionally farmed salmon from Norway just like farm salmon here has a questionable reputation. Everyone wants the wild caught salmon. 
Right. And we know here in the United States that the farmed salmon is not as good for the environment for a bunch of reasons. Salmon eat other fish. So the act of having to source food for salmon is not an environmentally friendly practice, not to mention because they're kind of in these in these confined and high population environments. They have to be pumped with vitamins and antibiotics and all sorts of other things. Also, they're often dyed. There's lots of things happening with farm salmon where if you're trying to be an environmentalist and, and maybe also if you're trying to show off in your grocery cart, you're going to buy the wild caught salmon. The wild caught salmon is also usually more expensive. So uh, what University of Copenhagen wanted to do was to take 92 Danes and ask them to taste samples of conventional organic and wild caught smoked salmon. The first round was a blind test in which the test subjects were uninformed what type of salmon they were tasting. And then in the second, they were, they were informed as to what they were tasting. Can you guess what happened? I'm going to imagine it was like the wine tasting where they had people test taste which is the the cheap and which was the expensive yes. wine and they really couldn't tell. And they picked the two buck chuck, right? That's yeah. the more expensive wine. That's yeah. exactly what happened. So in the blind test, the conventional and organic salmons won over the wild salmon. So the farm salmon did better. Um, the wild salmon scored significantly lower than oh. both of the farmed products. But once the test subjects were informed what they were eating, it completely changed. Among uh, informed uh, it respondents, the conventional salmon placed last, wild salmon took second, and organic first. And so in this case, this seems to be a very specific bias that people want to say that the organic is the tastiest. This could be a, a, um, a larger issue that... that if you ask someone, does the organic produce taste best or better, they might tell you yes, but in a blind taste test, that may or may not be the case. And so part of this has to do with the perception that wild-caught salmon should taste better because it's better for the environment and it's more healthy. Um, but the other thing that they wanted to bring up is that farm salmon is much easier to get and is cheaper and so, therefore, taste buds could be accustomed to farmed salmon. Huh, because that's what people usually eat. Right. Another right. option is that the wild salmon has less flavor because it's leaner than the farmed salmon. So, th there could be a couple things going on here. Uh, I think it's an interesting thing to mention that it could be about kind of confirmation of, of what familiarity of just, mm -hmm. yeah, this is what I'm used to. This is what I grew up on. But I also think that this is a, a good reminder that often the the food that's not as good for us tastes better. <laughs> well, I think it means just that if you smoke food, if you're having smoked salmon, you could smoke a shoe at that point. You're not tasting fish anymore. Well, except you are because they still had a very clear preference. Right. Yeah. They, they so did. If, if, and, if, uh, if it doesn't matter what you're smoking, then they wouldn't be able to tell the difference. It's hard not to yeah. find a smoked fish. That's the problem in Denmark. It's hard to find something that's not smoked. Sure. And I'm not a big fan. I just prefer <laughs> just give me the fish. Well, Which just, you know, do, yeah, just stick with it. Have fun. <laughs> Pick up a taste for that smoked fish. Well, anyway, I think so a couple takeaways from this. One being if you want people to choose the more environmentally friendly option, label it. Yeah. Because then people will choose based on the fact that they want to be environmentally friendly. Yeah. Or healthier yeah. or whatever it is. So um, labels actually could <clears throat> benefit. Basically, the act of greenwashing could benefit the environment if used appropriately, which I think is funny. Mm -hmm. But also, uh, yeah, it's just a good reminder that what the thing that's healthier or cleaner or better doesn't always taste better. Yeah, and you yeah, can't exactly. always tell the difference. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, can, you don't always make the, the, the right choice. Yeah. And it might not be healthier. Hey, I've got an organic thing here. It tastes worse and is less healthy, but it's better for the planet. Like that's another, it's like a third rail option right there. You know, you have to admit at some point, like eh, sometimes the thing with the 
a lot of preservatives and additives that uh, tore down part of a rainforest. It's a tastier snack. Yeah. It's not tastier once you say it like that, Justin. <laughs> oh, I'm not nothing that tore down a rainforest is going to taste delicious. But when you're thinking of delicious things, have you ever thought about how a those delicious coffee, it, but... yeah, how those delicious things affect your teeth? Ooh. And how you know, when you're going for the really delicious stuff that possibly has sugar in it, suddenly you're potentially prone to more cavities. Or if you're drinking something acidic, that maybe that's going to affect the enamel, the dentin and the enamel on your teeth, making you prone to more cavities. Have you ever thought about whether or not other primates get cavities too? Yes, I have. <laughs> I'm gonna guess that I, I was gonna guess that you had uh, there. Interesting. I don't. I can't think of a single time when I've seen another primate species brush its teeth. Exactly. So, Blair, have you pre have, have as a as a as a zookeeper in a previous incarnation? Uh, did you ever brush a primate's teeth other than your own? No. However. Whenever we did a full workup, we would do uh, a close tooth inspection to make sure. And sometimes, actually a few times, uh, a human dentist came out to work on primate teeth. Oh, fascinating. Yeah. Did you, and this is going to be definitely anecdotal because you probably weren't looking for it, but could you say what different primates ate based on whether or not they got cavities. Were some primates more or less prone to cavities? Ooh. No. I have no idea. I feel like well, carnivore I feel like carnivore teeth usually is grosser. <laughs> is that a thing? <laughs> They're grosser from the meat eating aspect, but uh some researchers sugars, just published. I go their, the other way around. Yeah, they published a study of they, they looked at 11 different primate species, a bunch of different, a bunch of different catarine primates and looked to see what was going on in their teeth. So checked bacterial levels, looked for dental caries, looked for, um, I guess you don't call it weathering, but <laughs> erosion, <laughs> periodontal d disease in the teeth. They looked at Chimpanzees, Western Lowland Gorillas, Colossus Gibbon, Hamadryas Baboons, Pigtailed Langurs, Japanese Macaque, Dense Mona Monkey, Blue Monkey, Mandrel, Raffles Banded Langur, and the Menta Y Langur. All of the specimens were wild. So none of these were receiving zoo diets. These were all wild diets that they were eating. And while cavities have been seen in zoo primates because and and we're feeding them whatever food seems good from the zookeeper perspective wild animals Mostly are potentially 20s. out there yeah getting their own food and they found that out of the 11 i mean they looked at a bunch of different teeth but only five species had cavities that they could see in their in their front teeth because when it's in the front teeth the most because these animals do a uh, a practice of taking fruit and then squishing it in their front teeth <laughs> and sucking the sugar out and it is a um, a dedicated practice of these of these animals and so uh you would expect because they're eating the sweet sweet fruits getting the sugars and sucking them down that they're potentially going to be doing more damage to their teeth this practice is called wadging Mm -hmm. They they wedge these fruits in their mouth and suck out the liquid. Um, so they determined that, yes, uh, chimpanzees, gorillas, uh, a bunch of these animals that tend to enjoy the sweeter fruits had cavities, whereas others that don't do this wedging behavior don't get or they didn't have mm -hmm. uh, the cavities. So that in itself was very interesting, something mm. new. But really, it's uh, it's interesting to note that cavities are shared by many different species of animals. If they have teeth, they have the potential for getting cavities, but they don't always have dentists. 
Unless they're in the zoo. Well, they also, the the other thing that's really important to remember is they, they often don't live long enough to get cavities in the wild. <laughs> when you have full-time veterinary care in captivity, animals often live a lot longer than they do in the wild, which allows their teeth to to rot. Right. Yeah. Interestingly, though, this particular study, they found more decayed teeth in female chimpanzees than male chimpanzees. They don't know why that was. Mm -hmm. But overall, their conclusion is that the cavities seem to be indicative. The patterns of the cavities themselves seem to be indicative of food processing behaviors and diet. Mm -hmm. So by looking at teeth of maybe trapped animals uh, that you're sampling or of deceased animals that you've discovered, you can get insight into what they eat, how they eat, and their ecological behaviors. Just kind of cool. Mm -hmm. Cavities! The scientist's best friend. Yes. Justin, do you have another story? You want to reproduce this one? Uh, <laughs> what was it? What, what did they call the thing? Uh, wadging, uh, wadging. Mm -hmm. I want to try wadging. I feel like Have you, I've, if you've ever been at a soccer match and you take the orange and like stick the orange slice in your mouth and with the peel on the outside and okay, and grin with a big orange okay. smile, you are engaging in wadging. Oh, it's basically yeah. chewing on or playing with something that is non chewable or digestible in your mouth. Mm-hmm. Okay. Wadging. Wadging. Who knew that was the thing? You New could word. Do? Vocabulary vocabulary for the night. <laughs> Wadging. All right. This next story is troubling, to say the least. Eight years ago, a team of researchers launched a project to carefully replicate influential high-impact lab experiments in cancer research. Uh, they picked papers. And major science journals like Cell, Science, Nature, uh, between the years 2010 and 2012. All of the papers were of preliminary research. So this is research on mice or in a lab dish type of a thing. These all were things that hinted at future therapeutic uses. Results in all of these studies no doubt had caveats of optimism uh, embedded in phrases like may one day lead to the foundations of a new path to open doors into novel therapies or approaches to advance the science of blah, 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 blah. They recreated 50 experiments and there was a problem. About half of the claims could not be replicated. And actually, it may have been much, much worse than that because uh, while they're while they're talking about, they're publishing about the 50 research experiments, uh, only having uh, about 50% uh, 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 reproducibility. There were actually about 200 experiments in 53 papers at the outset of their project, but there was insufficient information about how most of the experiments were done. Uh, so muddy and vague were the published papers and detailing experiments that uh, only the 50 could be done with confidence. And even then, uh, uh, I think uh, about 40%, third of those needed them to contact the researchers to get more information about reagents involved or techniques involved. Some of the researchers they contact, he listed as unhelpful. Some were more than unhelpful. 32% they listed as more than unhelpful, which is, you have to think is like, not helpful is just, I'm not going to help you. More than unhelpful. Sounds like they were upset that their research was They're being actively at. unhelpful. <laughs> yeah, actively. Like sending them bad data. Yeah, something. So yeah, ultimately 50 replication experiments from 23 of the original papers were completed, generating data about the uh, repeatability of a total of 158 effects reported in those papers. Replication effect sizes uh, were 85% smaller on average than in the original findings. Only 46% of effects replicated successfully. 
on more criteria than they had failed at. And original positive results were half as likely to replicate successfully, actually 40%. Uh, and then they had uh, no results from the originals that replicated 80%. 20% of null results produced results when they hadn't before. Collectively, the evidence suggests opportunities to improve transparency, sharing, and the rigor of preclinical research. So there, this is, this is uh, again, not, uh, these are not drugs that went to market that were being tested. Those have made it through many, many uh, rounds of evidence and experiment and trials and all of that sort of thing. This is all preliminary stuff. There is, this is quoting uh, Marcia McNutt, who's the president of the National Academy of Sciences. There's little incentive for researchers to share methods and data so that others can verify the work. Researchers lose prestige if their results don't hold up to scrutiny. And there are built-in rewards for publishing discoveries. So there's pressure to publish, and um, I don't want you to look at how I did my science because I don't want you to make fun of me if I made a mistake kind of a thing. That's not a good system. That's yeah. not a good system to be and I imagine, pipelining. You know, there's, it's, it's not wanting to be made fun of, but it's also, you know, maybe the data was... Uh, transposed or maybe there's something incorrectly entered because they you know had a student entering instead of doing it themselves or there were no quality control methods to make sure the data was entered correctly or or fraud or, or there's or outright, fraud. outright fraud yeah you know, when you're talking about 50 percent uh a lot. and but it's certain... the publisher parish pipeline is a real yeah. thing and it is not it is not created in a way that uh, it benefits science because this is the kind of stuff that comes out of it. People rush to get papers out. They don't make sure they've got the 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 best data. Uh, you know, it's like, oh, we did it. Okay, publish or do it again. It's and there and there's just not enough money to maintain the pipeline of let's do that experiment over again and let's do it again and let's make sure our methods are really rigorous. You know, sometimes it's. These labs running on a shoestring, trying to Daniel get Smith done. And, Daniel Smith in the chat room saying, or just bias seeping in. And that's 100% uh, going to be part of this. Uh, you, you believe, you believe your, uh, your experiment is, will reveal something important. And you run your experiment and you get a signal and you say, aha, this means X, Y, Z. Therefore... Uh, so it could just be bias. It could be bad. Some poor experiment setup. Part of it is just, it could be that people aren't sharing how they did the experiments in the first place. Yeah. So there was, I love uh, the, there are the pre, the pre experiment open servers that researchers are using now where researchers put their plan for their study out to be critiqued by members of the community and their statistical mes methods, like basically all the logic for what they're going to do before they do the experiment. Mm -hmm. And so then the community can say, no, you need to change this statistical test or this isn't, this reagent isn't going to work. And so the process is transparent from the be very beginning, but those are, those are really just getting started at this point. Yeah, this is, uh, there was a couple things that they found here. Among the studies that did not hold up was one that found a certain gut bacteria was tied to colon cancer in humans. Another was for a type of drug that shrunk breast tumors in mice. A third was a mouse study of a potential prostate cancer drug didn't hold up, although that one apparently is, has been moving through and is in preclin or is in clinical trials right now. So... Uh, some of this is going to be not being transparent, perhaps, about how you did an experiment. If you got a result that can't be replicated, is it because somebody didn't want to share how they did their experiment in the first place? And if so, the information that's out there, is that false information? Yeah. And is that then going to mislead others down so the road? So many questions. Met the so many yeah, questions. It goes way back. Yeah. A lot of it is... Uh, is a little, so this is the... 
this is the from where the folks came from here. Uh, this is the second major analysis by the Reproducibility Project, is what this is called. I think this is through the Center for Open Science who's doing this. In 2015, this is the group that found similar problems when they tried to repeat experiments uh, that were in the psychology right. uh, realm. Yeah, and similar, yeah, similar problems were found. Lack of ability to reproduce stuff. I think, you know, psychology is impacting. You know, <laughs> for a lot of those studies, it was impacting things like self-help books, um, but you know, also mental health uh, practices and other things. But um, it with the cancer research that very often is directly impacting medications, treatments, um, you know, and heading and, down and the research road. dollars. You know, this research is the, do it's all research dollars. If we have if we have this pool of research dollars that we're going to spend, and there are individuals doing confirmation bias uh, within their experiments, have bad experiment, poor experiments set up, are falsifying results of their experiments. To the you know, there's a point when you are now engaged in the form of theft of of those research dollars. Uh, shouldn't yep. shouldn't be allowed, and so there should be a, a better standard of transparency and uh, for these experiments to be done in a way that can be replicated. Uh, anyway, it's just for the sake of science. I don't yeah. care about your well, institution that you work for. Yeah, your and prestige. speaking, Let's get it right. And speaking of replication and uh, what you do over and over again, something we do every night, hopefully many of us, sleep. I mean, it's hard to come by for some. Um, and there are those of us who have shift work that keeps them awake all night long. And we've talked a lot on the show about how do you stay healthy when we know that there is a mismatch between the circadian rhythm of the normal 24 hour day with the sun coming up and wanting to sleep at night and the timing of shift work that can be negatively and has been shown to be negatively effective on on many people and research just published in science advances looked at the question of how does food play into this and the timing of when you eat so what time does science say you should eat? In the daytime, according to this study. Yes, we should all be eating in the daytime. And shift workers, apparently, uh, based on this study in which they, they mismatched, they dysregulated people's schedule and had them exist in a shift work type schedule or a normal schedule and then had them eat in daytime or at nighttime and measured glu glucose, glucose tolerance, intolerance, insulin levels, uh, these factors, the glycemic control factors that uh, are involved in metabolic dysfunction as a result of shift work. And previous work had really only ever been done in mice. In this, they saw that the people, and it was very small groups, like around nine and 10 people per group. So this is still very small research study. But the effect was very clear that the individuals who stayed up all night but ate during the day, they had better glycemic control than those individuals who shifted their eating habits to their nighttime waking working hours. And the mechanism behind this, they think, is that we have a central circadian clock that is triggered by light and the melatonin system, but that eating affects peripheral Zeitgebers, the Zeitgebers that when you eat, it, it triggers and retunes other clocks in your body related to metabolism. So your brain will be on one clock going, this is the day, this is the time, sun comes up, we're just fine. And then you eat something at three in the morning and the rest of your body goes, no, we're fine. And so then they're shouting at each other and they don't get along anymore. And you don't want that. So this, this is interesting because I will say um, my personal experience with, with a shift worker is that he does not eat lunch when he works at night. Right. That's good. But he does eat lunch if he's awake during the day. 
So is it because is... you're there and want to eat lunch or is it because <laughs> he's hungry? It's uh, I think it's both. Uh, I do think that he doesn't get hungry for food in the same way at night, which might be a response of his body being like, it's nighttime. It's now food time. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. So it's it's an interesting bit of evidence. Uh, it's like I said, small study, but uh, the animal evidence, the cellular evidence, the now, now humans evidence is accumulating and yeah, try not to eat at night. It's an easy take home message. Science says eat during the daytime. I hope they use this on Jeopardy. Okay. I guess that's it for the first part of the show. Woo! Stories, stories, stories. This is This Week in Science. I do hope that you are enjoying the stories that we bring to you every week. Please head over to twist.org and get yourself a calendar. The Twist 2022 calendar is available now for you and for your family and friends as gifts. Coming on back for the COVID update. Let's try to get through it quickly because we don't like bad news. <laughs> Justin just left. He didn't I know. Justin's like, COVID update, I'm leaving. All right. The Omicron variant that we love to talk about now. It's the new, the new hot variant on the COVID scene is spreading rapidly around the world, causing concern on the basis of potentially increased transmissibility and immunity evading mutations. It has been detected now in 19 states in the United States, but Delta is still the dominant variant, while neutralization of Omicron is decreased by 41-fold. This was based on a study of under 20 people, so take that with a grain of salt. In previously infected or vaccinated individuals, protection against severe outcomes does appear to be maintained. So, you're vaccinated for the original variants. You can Go still science. fight off Delta, and you might not be able to fight off Omicron as well, but maybe it, you still won't end up in the hospital. Yeah. Additionally... That's winning. That is winning. <laughs> Additionally, vaccination after infection and booster does seem to get those immune responses going again, boosting the antibodies that do help with protection against Omicron. So the boosters and infection do continue to give you some protection. It also appears that immunity against Delta gained from infection lasts up to 13 months. A study looked at people who had been just infected with COVID-19, with SARS-CoV-2 and had COVID-19, and how long they seemed to uh, produce antibodies to protect them against the Delta variant, not looking at Omicron, but they saw that the antibody levels from immunity from infection lasted up to about 13 months. So if you got vac if you caught COVID, now you can get vaccinated now that Omicron's working its way through and all of those antibodies will be additionally protective. So all of it can work together to help keep you protected. Get all the antibodies. Uh, all the, the, the what? Omicron Persia 8 uh, variant is showing up everywhere very rapidly. So it is ruining Christmas uh, <laughs> no, no, it's for not. everyone. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it is. is. Don't go to the mall. Just... You're going to have to, we're going to, you know, we keep talking about like, oh, Wear your masks. Just, remember the pandemic? Yeah, it's really, okay, you can remember the variant. Oh. <laughs> remember that first variant, the second one, the third variant, and how those pandemics were slightly different from the one we're now in? I think we're just going to be in constant pandemic stage from here on out. So, well, hopefully, uh, a lot of doctors are split. and scientists are thinking that th these mutations we're seeing in Omicron, they are still highlighting the fact that the ACE2 receptor is very important for the virus to gain entry into cells. And because of that, that limits the um, mutational ability of the virus and uh, the, the, in, the ability of the virus to increase its infectivity. 
or virulence because if it only has lim if the mutations are limited because of that constraint it's going to be better for us however See, there's a question what oh i was gonna say yeah you can actually you can mutate into a less lethal version it could and this I mean, is this the is, thing this, this is the thing and early data point. early data for omicron has scientists and doctors very optimistic that Omicron, even though it's highly transmissible, might not be as virulent uh, or dangerous as previous uh, variants, although it could be a vaccine effect as well. And it could be, you know, a bias effect based right. on different populations that have been vaccinated and the age groups that are ending up in the hospitals. But uh Right now, evidence from South African hospitals do suggest that fewer individuals are on ventilators or oxygen and that, um, you know, people have come into the hospital for other reasons. And they're like, oh, I have COVID. I didn't even know. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is a good thing in a way, but it's too early to celebrate at this point in time. But everybody's crossing their fingers that maybe Omicron is a step in the direction of a little less nasty of a yeah virus. it's a reminder that a, a good parasite or a good virus doesn't kill its host <laughs> right so, so it actually, so many of us it becoming less virulent isn't it doing a bad job it's actually kind of doing a better job at surviving if it can maintain in the environment without killing its host <laughs> so yeah because that's the other thing what would have actually helped if it became extremely lethal and just killed everyone within the first 24 hours. Uh, if it did that, we wouldn't have had this huge spread because all of the hosts would have died almost upon contact. Uh, it's this whole being sick for weeks and being able to spread it without you know dying right away that, that makes a pandemic so Oh, uh, it's that early asymptomatic phase where you're like, I feel mm. fine. And you're like out. You go breathe on everybody. <laughs> You know, that's what I do when I go out in public. I breathe on people. <laughs> Pull your mask down Constantly. and then breathe on them. Yeah. Uh, Blair, yes. do you want to give us some good news about COVID? Let's let's take let's let's do an upswing. Um, can we can we do it? Maybe. Good news, everyone. I'm gonna tell you this story, but okay. maybe. Maybe it's maybe. Good news. Maybe. this is okay. from University of Pennsylvania. It's for a chewing gum that could reduce. SARS-CoV-2 transmission. Okay, I um, take it. Yeah, so they, they have have made this chewing gum, which is laced with a plant-grown protein that serves as a trap for COVID, which reduces the viral load in saliva, which is often the main method for transmission. And so we know that SARS-CoV-2 replicates in salivary glands. We know that when someone sneezes, coughs, or speaks, or sings, or laughs, or yells, that the virus could be expelled and reach others. We know it's aerosolized, but the droplets definitely have a big punch, right? And so the idea of this gum is that it offers an opportunity to neutralize the virus in the saliva, which cuts down on a major source of transmission. So this was a combination of two things, which is why I think it's interesting. So originally, there were research groups showing that injections of ACE2 could reduce viral load in people with severe infections. Meanwhile, there was another line of research looking at developing a chewing gum infused with plant-grown proteins to disrupt dental plaque. So they took those two pieces of research, mm. combined them, took the ACE2 protein synthesis in plants, and then put that into this gum made out of plants. And so for those two things, then they were able to have this ACE2 from plants in chewing gum that enables the protein to cross mu mucosal barriers, facilitates binding, and incorporates the plant material all together into a delicious cinnamon flavored gum tablet. <laughs> so then they expose sal fantastic. saliva. Yeah. So they exposed saliva samples from COVID-19 patients to the ACE2 gum and found that the levels of viral RNA fell so quickly that it was almost undetectable. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Totally not Amazing. Worth it. So here's the other thing I'm thinking about is <laughs> how much, how many other you, things? If you chew gum with a mask on, 
What happens? The mask oh. will fall off or go up or go down. It's definitely... I don't know if chewing gum is congruent with wearing a mask. So I, I don't know. That was right. one of the things I was I will let about. you know that I chew gum and wear a mask. Oh, really? Yeah. It just depends on how aggressive it makes it smell you're nicer. That gum, Blair. I don't know. Right. I don't know how you're oh, going okay. at it. But, okay. 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 Uh, Yellow Sater, instead of having masks, we'll have a lot more gum on the sidewalks. Yeah. I don't think it's worth surviving a pandemic if everyone's chewing gum. <laughs> I, think, I, think it, I think that's a worse outcome than the. Well, that's the other a thing. Like, percentage of people die. You know those aerosol <laughs> graphics where they show how much, how many droplets are exiting your mouth. If you're walking around chewing oh, on gum, gum smackers. is no, more maybe, coming but out. maybe that's actually helping to destroy the virus <laughs> in the air because of the proteins yeah. in the gum. Okay. Being operating yeah, as a filter. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. know. Anyway, the research team is currently working towards obtaining permission to conduct a clinical trial. So that they can officially evaluate whether the approach is safe and effective when people are infected with SARS-CoV-2. So you could check into the hospital. They'd be like, oh, you've got COVID. Here's some gum. Have some gum. Treat it with gum. I mean, that could, I mean, listen, it's not going to prevent you from getting sick and it's not going to get you like better if you are sick. But what it would do if you showed up in the hospital with COVID-19 and you could choose this gum, it could reduce the risk of getting people working in the hospital sick, which would sure. be pretty great. And it it's known that uh, nasal saline spray can help rinse out your sinuses and help rinse out viruses that are in there so that saline spray, saline rinses can help reduce your chance of getting infected with a respiratory virus. So I'm thinking nasal spray and chewing gum. Mm. I mean, that's the drugstore list that I need. Every Step one, week. neti pot. Step two, neti pot. gum. Gum. There you go. Yes. Just be sure and to I use distilled the... water in your neti pot. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Don't give yourself a brain eating and ame amoeba. Oh, yeah. Process. Those things yeah. are very dangerous. Yeah, don't want to do that. Yeah. But uh, I love the aspect of this chewing gum that it's plant based that mm -hmm. it's plant derived there is also a vaccine being uh produced in canada by a company called medicago with GlaxoSmithKline, and they have created a plant derived virus like particle vaccine so hmm. the virus like particles are basically little tiny bits of protein that look like the sars cov2 virus and then the uh, then there's an adjuvant that gets packaged in there also, and then when you get the vaccine, the adjuvant works with those virus-like particles to tell your body, "This is what you want to fight off." But they are growing it in tobacco plants, so they're growing it in plants that are being used for the production of other drugs. It's uh, a or also potato plants. Um, these plants are are consumed by people widely and plants like potato are very unlikely to produce a uh, an allergic reaction in people so these this vaccine it's thought that it could be safer for a large number of people in its production and that it works pretty well it has finished a clinical trial stage 3 clinical trial not against um, Omicron, but this is the first clinical trial with like over 20,000 people that looked at things like Delta variant and the other variants that are out there. And while the early trials had like 90-ish, 95% effectiveness, the effectiveness has gone down to about 70, 75% with the newer variants. Don't know what it would be with Omicron, but this vaccine in combination with all the others or even to boost vaccine supply is very likely to be a huge benefit. Where'd your vaccine come from? Plants in Canada. Potatoes. Potatoes. Yeah. Taters. 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 I got my potato vaccine and I got a side of fries. <laughs> Tater shots. Yeah. Tater shots. Tater shots. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> that that sounds like a um a food you would eat at a party where there's uh there's molten cheese in a syringe. <laughs> oh boy. 
This is This Week in Science. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode. We have more stories yet to come. And we do thank you for joining us and hope that you're enjoying it. If you are enjoying the show, please share us with a friend today. All right, we're going to come on back right now. And it is time for Blair's Animal Corner. With Blair. She loves our creature, great and small. By pet, mill a pet, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. And a bird What you got, Blair? I have migratory birds. How did you keep them? Oh, I didn't. They ran away. Oh. <laughs> So they do, you see. What do all migratory birds have in common? They are birds. True. Mid Atlantic accent. <laughs> <laughs> They're light colored. Yes. What? This is, oh. Yep. I would not have <laughs> having studied birds, I still would not have put that together. Yes, really? this is this is yeah. This is uh, something that is a one sentence story, but I had to explain it further because it it's wild to me. So this is from Max Planck Institute for Ornithology in Germany. And they had this theory, Casper Delhi had this theory that lighter plumage is selected for in migratory species because it reduces the risk of overheating when exposed to sunshine. So this would be particularly important for long distance migrants because they can't stop to rest in shade, take a drink, do lots of other things to help temperature regulate. So if they are too hot, they they're in big trouble. They they can't they can't stop. So uh, the, this research group had been studying the effects of climate on bird coloration in general. So as temperatures rose, the expectation was that birds would get lighter colored. And in earlier studies, they showed that in general, that lighter colored birds are found where temperatures are high and there is little shade. Around that same time, the researchers came across studies by others that showed that some birds fly at higher altitudes during the day compared to at night, which is a huge cost uh, energetically. To go higher in altitude, there has to be a really good reason to do that because you're you're flapping more you you have to you know it's, it's just it's way harder than than coasting closer to the water so the what they th their kind of guess was that by flying higher where it's colder that offsets the heat absorbed by plumage when the sun is hot so the the cost benefit analysis right it's beneficial to go higher up even though it takes more energy because they they don't get as hot and so another way to reduce risk of overheating would be generally to just be lighter colored and so their general question was has have migratory species evolved lighter feathers they were able to quantify their plumage lightness from zero as completely black to 100, completely white, for all bird species using bird images from the handbook of the birds of the world. And then they compared their data on coloration with the species migratory behavior. And they, while doing that, they also controlled for other factors that are known to affect plumage color. So overall, they found that bird species colors get increasingly lighter as they migrate more this is true on on aquatic animals or on land dwelling migrants and so uh, similarly resident birds were darker than short distance migrants so there really was this kind of gradient from a super sedentary bird really dark super migratory super light something in the middle in the middle in color as well Hmm. Yeah, so the consistence across different types of birds, large and small, geography, all of it, it seemed to really be true around the world. And so what this means is that temperature has a really important role in color, animal coloration. 
Right. So, of course, this has implications for birds in climate change, potential adaptive evolutionary responses to climate change, identifying future winners and losers and evolutionary pressure. And so they, they plan to continue to explore the connection between migration, climate, and other factors that shape the evolution of the color of plumage in birds. But yeah, this is something I've never heard before. Kind of makes a lot of sense. But also is surprising. <laughs> it is surprising. Yeah. I, I I mean, I would, I mean, it's not something that you would just, you know, oh, make that, you, know, you wouldn't just notice it because you notice maybe the darker colored birds or, you know, there's different color. I mean, seabirds, yeah, they're lighter colored, but maybe that's because of predation, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe that they need to look lighter from the bottom when yep. they're floating on top of the water. Counter shading. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yes. the impact of the actual temperature <laughs> and coloration, that's fascinating. Yeah, which makes sense. You don't want to go to some place that's 90 degrees wearing all black. It's not comfortable. No, so. but then uh, if you're if you're going to hang out someplace where it's cold, maybe you'd want that because then you'd warm up easier. But if I, you're if you're running a marathon, even if it's cold, you don't want to be wearing all black. Okay. And I think that's the point, right? Is that these birds are putting in such an intense metabolic effort? Yeah, that they there's trade offs that have off. really influenced. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Now I'm going to look at birds. I go, you light colored bird, you must be a migrant. Mm -hmm. Just remember there's always. Yes. There's always exceptions. And there's outliers. This is a, this is a mathematical model. So this is yes. on the whole. If you kind of like smooth and average mm -hmm. out the graph, this is the information that you get. But of course, yeah, there's outliers. Um, speaking of um, trade offs. <laughs> Do say. Yeah. Uh, if you are a male golden orb weaver spider, you have a very difficult trade-off to balance. If you, did... I, 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 you said spider, so I, yeah. and you said male, so yes. I imagine that we're going somewhere with like the trade-off being the spider's death. Correct. So if he gets too close <laughs> to the female too soon, he'll just get eaten. Mm -hmm. And that'll be it. If he gets too close to competitors on the web, could also get eaten or killed. So this male or weaver spider has to perfectly balance a slow orbit around the female to get her attention, but not too fast and not too close, but faster than the other males, but not too close to them. Just enough to be able to mate with that female. If he makes one wrong move, it's, he's dinner. So this uh, was a piece of research also from Max Planck Institute, this time from the Institute of Animal Behavior. They looked at spiders for over a decade and wanted to figure out what, what optimization technique do these male spiders use to know exactly how to approach a female. They have a, a clump of nerves that's barely a brain. <laughs> <laughs> it's i mean they're not they're not dumb in terms of animals they do lots of cool things but are they there doing intense statistical analysis of how close to get to a female no they're not so how do they do this and specifically how do they do it with the precision of an orbiting planet around a star what yes so they were able to I mean, is the female spider, the, is, it, is, it, is it, are these gravitational dynamics that we're dealing with? Yes. Here? <laughs> yes. So they, they're, they're likening gravitational dynamics and the push pull of an electron around a, a, around a nucleus, right? As similar to the animal magnetism that is a system of pushes and pulls as these male right. spiders orbit around the female. They kind of, as a joke, said they looked like electrons orbiting a nucleus or planets orbiting a star. And then the, the more they looked at it, the more it kind of fit. 
And so they were able to develop a physical model and they performed experiments in the Panamanian rainforest on spiders. And so uh, to kind of, to put it uh, eloquently (laughs) as uh, Alex Jordan did, Uh uh, he said, yeah, I'm not going to do it. He said, quote, imagine electrons orbiting a nucleus or a massive star in space so large that it generates its own gravitational field pulling in objects around it. The giant cannibalistic female can be thought of in the same way. Now imagine smaller planets, satellites, or comets coming near this attractive force. These are our tiny, brave males. Approach the star or female too rapidly or at the wrong angle, and you risk getting caught up in her attractive pull. On a cosmic scale, this would result in cosmic collision that vaporizes the planet. For the intrepid male, an incorrect approach means falling into a fatal attraction and ending up prey. So they were able to, through these observations, see how overzealous males became dinner (laughs) and how others were successful. Just as the smaller planets have their own gravitational pull, the males also had their own within each other as they approached rivals. The males started to repel each other as they got closer and closer, behaving much more like electrons around a nucleus. So this is where the the, the kind of the nucleic method comes in. Um, So then the the motion of the males resembles interactions between particles that attract or repel each other, depending on the distance between them. So they were able to very loosely, I will say, apply these two models, kind of the planet and the, the planets around a star for the female, and then the electrons around a nucleus for the males to demonstrate that the push pull attractions of these animals and the kind of the, the constant cost benefit move of like, Oh, not too close. Oh, but I got to get close. Oh, but not too close. It actually shows that it's not a complex set of decisions that the males are making. They're not sitting there with their pen and paper going like, okay, but if I approach it 90 degrees, right? So they're not doing this. It's actually a very simple dynamic force that is played out in other places in nature. And so, (laughs) um, this is a way of explaining this extremely complex behavior without quote unquote complex cognitive machinery got it right i don't don't need a big brain to do all this but there are these little pieces that add up it's very precise it's also kind of like it's like the roomba (laughs) <laughs> sensing the wall and moving away from it before it touches it right so that's basically what's happening is there's all these spiders that are like their own little roombas that they're like oh too close push back okay let me try to get this but oh too close push back so it's just it's basically a constant reaction to the movements of these other spiders on the web in a way that looks very deliberate but really is just the dynamics of these different things moving in concert and responding to each other in real time. It is the emergence of order from a Mm -hmm. complex system. Order from chaos. Yes. (laughs) Mm, Yes, it is. Yeah, but I don't know. Isn't it, uh, isn't there going to be some like mechanism within the tiny little spider brain Oh, of course. Just going like danger. Okay. Yes. So there's, yes, absolutely. And that's the push pull. Talking, that's the like that is. attraction. Like, oh, danger. Oh, look, other male. Oh, but you know, the, yes, there's stimuli. The, the that idea are being, is but you're, but if you're you talking look about at a it, genetic memory, then at this point, you're talking about something the spiders aren't learning, but they're born with an innate uh, uh, knowledge that there's danger. And getting too close to the female. Okay, I, th- I think you're you're pulling the wrong thing. Let me try to explain one other way. So what this is saying is that if you observe a male spider get to a female orb weaver and successfully mate, it looks like a deliberate series of actions. It looks smooth. It looks beautiful. It looks like this very clear circular orbit of dynamic factors. It looks like a dance. It looks very specific and orderly. 
What this research is saying is that it is the exact opposite of that. It is not orderly. It is reactionary. And it is reaction. And that's why the, the talk about gravitational forces or repellent forces of electrons is a good analogy here because those things also look beautiful and deliberate, but they're really not. Yeah, I guess I'm still not quite yeah. seeing the connection there. Like, uh, like for me, those are just like this forces of nature, the physics. Uh, they're just abiding by like what's what, and how and where energy can and uh, gravitational forces of planets and stuff. It's like you got these tracks that you're going to fall into, and then you're going to have to be there no matter what. Uh, what we're talking about this spiders. Could, this, yeah. Oh, go ahead. But yeah. well, when you're talking about spiders, you're talking about mind in general. You know, humans do things all the time that they aren't consciously thinking about. I mean, you can go and about talk about the mathematics involved with throwing a ball in the air and then catching it. Yeah, if you had to sketch it out on paper, all of the physics involved, all of the mechanics involved, all the engineering involved, all these things, you never catch the ball. But as a human, you throw it up in the air, you catch it, it just does it. The mind processes things. There are things know. that the body and the brain can do without conscious control. There are things that we know that humans can do without uh -huh. consciously controlling it. We have spinal reflexes because of our spinal ganglia that allow us to walk without thinking about it. That's why people can walk down the street while typing on their iPhones and, you know, not run into. I mean, people do get run over by buses, unfortunately, all the time. But, you know, you can continue to walk and chew gum and do all these things because you have automatic mechanisms that are stimulate that are responses to stimuli. These responses to stimuli go way, 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 way back. Yes. But there is a point where you take conscious control over that when you realize right. there's something I'm going to trip over. I need to step up. I need to right. move my leg. I need to run. I need to jump. And you are right. changing the input. And I, and I think that that's is, what the spider's doing. No. And that is that's what, what Blair is saying do. is that that's the, what the study is about. That's I what get the study it. is. I get it. Yeah. I'm not quite buying it. <laughs> I'm thinking the spider's like, uh, so you you're know. thinking the spider's thinking. You really, I don't really think the spider is them. mathing it out, but I think the spider is thinking jump and just being able to jump. So this isn't about jumping. It, this is about, I know, I know, this I, is I, about I being on a web full of a one a cannibalistic giant female yes. and two, a bunch of other males. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so if, if they were being deliberate, they would say, okay, I'm going to duck around that guy, then go over here, then go over there, then get closer to her, get her attention back up, then come back and mate with her. Right. But that's not what and they're doing. And that's not no. what's happening. Correct. And that's what this study says. <laughs> They're not yeah, planning yeah. it out. They're not thinking about it. They are still doing things, but it's not with the top-down conscious control that we, we would say is thinking about something. Yeah, it's from yes. a spider's eye perspective. I don't know. I, well, I we're not spiders, so yeah. So we don't know what kind of consciousness they have. We don't know what thinking to a spider is for sure because we can't talk to a spider. I can't yeah. talk to my cat other than in meow language. You know, and I apply a lot of anthropomorphisms to my cat. People apply anthropomorphisms to their dogs. You know, until we can answer these questions or get the conversation with these, all these animals, we don't really know. But right, and, I, and they're applying small, them to computational spiders and planets at the same time. I got a little problem with it. But the computational spiders. power. This is something that also could be uh, probably modeled with a neural net, with something that's very simple, black box style inputs and outputs. Yeah. Justin, do you want to talk about science now? Because we got to keep this show going. Oh, did it stop? Actually, it's time for the show to be over. Bye, everyone. This, Good night. <laughs> Good night. Did the show <laughs> stall? I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, okay, I'll talk fast. Is... Uh, Tanzania, on the east coast of the African continent, home to many of the world's mightiest beasts, uh, the elephant, the lion, the leopard, the buffalo, the rhino, and the bear, uh, also has the oldest evidence of upright walking hominins. 
Uh, ever discovered it's at the uh, Laetoli uh, Tanz- in Tanzania in 1978. Paleontologist Mary Leakey may have heard of that uh, name before. And her team found two sets of fossilized footprints that date to 3.7 million years ago and are thought to be Australopithecus afarensis, the species of the famous Lucy skeleton. So they got footprints. They got a couple of tracks of these footprints out there. And they go, oh, great. We can see 3.7 million years ago upright walking. There's another set of footprints. Partially excavated in a nearby site. Uh, it was actually found a little earlier than that, a few years before. That was uh, dismissed because it was uh, bears. It was bears walking on bipedally, uh, apparently. Recent re-excavation of those footprints are reported in the journal Nature and revealed that the footprints were not made by bears. Ooh. They were made by, also by bipedal hominins. However, not Australopithecus afarensis. Dun, dun, uh-huh. dun. <clears throat> so, yeah, they went, they had some fun here. This is, uh, given the increasing evidence of for locom- locomotor species diversity in the hominin fossil record over the past 30 years, these unusual prints deserved another look, says lead author Allison McNutt, assistant professor at Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine at Ohio University, and the second McNutt that I'm reporting on in this same show, which is very interesting. Uh, the to determine <laughs> so they did all this one stuff. So they had they had found these they had these bears uh, that are in a rescue park, and uh, they they lured them with with treats on sticks basically, and got them to walk over mud. So that they could they could see they could check out what a, a black bear footprint might look like. Uh, they also did the observations of black bears in the wild and found they only walked on their back feet uh, less than one percent of the time. So it was very unlikely that the footprints that they had, they found in Laetoli, especially since there are no four mm, footprints in the ground at any given time, the individual only is on two, uh, the two legs. Unlikely the bear. They studied some chimpanzees at a sanctuary in Uganda. Again, one of the discoveries they made is the heels for both bears and chimpanzees tend to be rather thin compared to the footprints that are uh, that are found in Laetoli. Uh, also, the, there's a large toe and a large second uh, toe next to it, which also kind of nailed it down as to being a human and comparing the these footprints though to the morphology and the and the gait that they would expect from the australopithecus afrensis they said no it, it's distinct it's a different foot it's a different gait this is some other hominin walking around that we don't know who don't know who don't it's know just who this some one is. other yeah but we know there's a lot of variation in within a species so it could have been i mean could it have been an australopithecus that was hopping or playing around that had a a a lame leg or yeah so so also part of one one, i guess some of this footprint also involves a crossing over step that is almost as though someone were losing balance or like an off balance step where you're recovering balance almost. Maybe so, they were carrying something and tripped yeah. or yeah. could be. Could be. Uh, but also very unbear like in the in the yeah. narrowness of the stances. Bears also tend to be much wider. But it's very interesting that in 1976 this got dismissed as bear. And then here we are, I don't know how many years that is, 40 something years later. We're like, oh no, we just discovered a possibly new hominin in these footprints that uh yeah, we didn't know was uh walking around well Back we thought the- brontosauruses were real then too they are right <laughs> we've learned so much they are <laughs> they got brought back you haven't you heard there's brontosaurus is a dinosaur now okay uh, the saurosaurs 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish where I started. Uh, finish you can only, only go so far in this world but find, before you find yourself at a door. You unlock that door with the key of education. But what if you don't happen to have a key on you? What do you do then? Prison. That's what. Uh, we've all been there, staring at the walls of our cell, wondering, how what? the heck did I wind up here? We have. And more importantly, perhaps. We all have. What? How can I keep from coming back? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. New study. Yeah, everybody's been to prison a couple times. Come on. Who are we kidding? Uh, new study uh, looked at the effects of college in prison in a prison program called uh, the Bard Prison Initiative (BPI). Bard Prison Initiative. Study found a large and significant reduction in recidivism. Recidivism is the rates at which people who have gone to jail, uh, prison, and been released. End back up again. Go back to prison. Make bad more choices that led them uh, to get arrested again. Study by researchers at Yale University, as well as folks working at BPI, uh, appears in Justice Quarterly, a publication of the Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences. This is quoting Matthew G.T. Denny, PhD student at Yale University, co authored the study. Incarceration is bound with systems of poverty and a lack of access to opportunity, especially education and socioeconomic mobility. Participation and in intensity of engagement in programs like BPI might disrupt these cycles. So there's a somewhat of a history of the federal government backing uh, prison education. Beginning back in 1960, 1965, People who were incarcerated in the United States were eligible for Pell Grants from the federal government to receive uh, funds to attend college, even though that they are incarcerated. So you have then jailhouse uh, education programs, colleges show up to educate these people who could spend the money, yada, yada, thanks to the federal government. 1994, Clinton administration, part of their 356-page Violent Crime in Law Enforcement Act, had one of the provisions which banned incarcerated students from receiving Pell Grants, effectively shutting down college in prison programs for especially for lower income inmates. It's kind of hard to uh, understand what exactly they expected the outcome of making sure that people who were incarcerated for some period of time left incarceration with the same level of education with which they entered incarceration in the first place? It was place? just a recipe for the the spiral to the bottom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's not helping anybody. Yeah. So, so yeah. So, uh, so mid-90s, Clinton administration wants to look tough on crime. They ban assault rifles. They spend a bunch of money on putting uh, more police on the road. They, they uh, dedicate money to uh, combating uh, violence against women. And they take textbooks away from imprisoned students because because that last one was really needed to happen 2016 obama administration started second chance pell pilot program federal aid once again is being offered to select colleges within the prison program systems uh this study though looked at the largest and most rigorous it uh, was the largest and most rigorous to date on the effects of college and prison programs on recidivism the program uh they looked at actually has been has weathered some of this storm of Pell Grant being there or not. They've been uh, had this prison program in place, a prison college program in place since 1999. And they are operating campuses in six New York correctional facilities. They, they found that it, the study found that participation reduced recidivism by 38%. Uh, greater levels of participation correlated closely with even lower rates of recidivism. So that's a huge number. Uh, returning to prison occurs within a year for nearly half of people who are released from prison. Nearly half. I think it's uh, 40, yeah, it's 40 something percent. Uh, released from prison, end up back in prison within a year. That's staggering. Within nine years, 
it's about 83 percent yeah it's too much it's I mean, here in the united states it is a system that is meant it's a it's a profit making system for the prison industrial complex it is a way to keep people in their place and it yeah if we really wanted to benefit society prison education systems would be well funded they would be try we would be trying to help people graduate from college while they are in in prison teach them a yeah. trade while they're in yeah. prison also re-education if on they so fight many fires things. while they're yes. in prison allow them to actually be firefighters yeah. when yeah. they leave That's smart right yeah, yeah dropping 38 yeah. percent of recidivism uh that has a significant impact on the population within the prisons which like you're saying could impact the that that prison fire uh, uh, the that what do you call it prison economic system industrial complex whatever which may be how it ended up in a bill in 1994. Probably. What, what other reason <laughs> would there be right well it's tough on crime uh, we're gonna show them they did bad things gonna... and we'll show them they'll be punished and by show them i mean my Forever. bottom line and my vacation <laughs> home <laughs> yeah so a few things here one since uh, education and opportunity are factors in how people wind up in prison in the first place uh, maybe focusing on those things in the first place <laughs> uh, might avoid needing to support the world's largest pop prison population industry uh, for America. <clears throat> Two, well, why wouldn't we want a system that rehabilitate, rehabilitates people and gives them those opportunities when they leave to make other choices on the outside? Right? So how, how a prison operates is entirely up to the society running the prison. We can we can do it as a warehousing of dangerous individuals. We can do it as a warehousing of people with mental illness or people who are uh, poor or lack access to education or housing, that sort of thing. Um, right now, it's a little frightening because there, there's a, a interesting side statistic and trying to look into this and see. I'm not going to bore you with numbers. The U.S. spends a lot of money on law enforcement, courts, and incarceration. Yes. But the trend is, uh, it used to be a one-to-one -one what we spent on law enforcement and what we spent on social programs that were meant to prevent poverty, uh, lift people out of poverty or prevent poverty from, you know, things like food stamps and social welfare stuff and temporary aid to get people on the road or grants for education for poor people. This used to be about a one-to-one, -one, uh, talking about 50 years ago, 60 years ago, one-to-one. -one. Now it's two to one, what we're spending uh, on the law enforcement side and sort of plateauing the amount of spending uh, or even dipping the amount of spending on that social poverty prevention and increasing the amount we are spending on fighting the symptom. Uh, even though the first one is preventative of the second. And it's a bad trend. This is trending towards, if you just follow this out across the infinite horizon, which is how Congress uh, does it for uh, uh, for retirement, right, for so many for Social things. Security. Yeah, it means that we're going to be in a police state where everybody, the entire economy, is driven on people in prison or working in prisons. It's it's yeah, eventually. sounds sounds logical. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay, that's that's good. That's a nice future that I'm looking forward to. We, I'm lying. I'm not looking forward to that at at all and maybe through science and scientific evidence we can benefit our society enough that we can make better choices hmm. that really work for us uh in the long run okay i have a couple of quick stories related to blood and proteins mm -hmm. and things that we love to help us we would love to have them help us live longer better stronger lives one paper was just published in Nature Aging. And this paper mm -hmm. in Nature Aging uh, out of the University of Pittsburgh has pinpointed that there are little transcripts, little bits of a protein called clotho that has been uh indicated previously as being beneficial in the 
uh, longevity process, try making aging not happen as quickly, rejuvenating aged individuals that uh, clotho can have a very beneficial effect. And in this particular case, these researchers were looking at muscle wasting. And as people age, it gets harder and harder for their muscles to rebuild themselves. You have increased scarring and weakness. And oh, someday you're just weak. I don't want to get weak. I want to stay strong. So this really makes me happy. Um, these researchers discovered that um, the blood contains extracellular vesicles. And this is not you know, beam me up, Scotty, talking about the vessels. This is extracellular vesicles, and they contain clotho. And in older individual, uh, younger individuals, you have lots and lots of clotho in lots and lots of extracellular vesicles. And all that clotho, it gets it. Those those vesicles, uh, they uh, they link to and they merge with the cells of the myofibers and the myofibers, they like the clotho transcripts and the clotho transcripts like to help the muscles grow and regenerate. So young muscles can regenerate better, have reduced scarring, are nice and strong. As you get older, fewer vesicles in the blood, less clotho in the vesicles. And they have discovered that if they take, of course, the young, the vesicles from the young blood and give the vesicles to the older blood, then the older blood can begin to rejuvenate the muscles like the younger blood, like the younger muscles once did. So we maybe will not have to go ahead with the drinking the blood of the young to oh, sure. maintain our, our muscle strength, uh, hopefully understanding that proteins like clotho and the little bits and pieces of the protein that uh, the muscles respond to that maybe we can use those and their uh, and their receptors as targets for muscular regeneration, anti-muscle wasting drugs and treatments as we get older. One aspect of um, of this of this work. Oh no, this is the next the next study is is something also very interesting moving away from the clotho. So Blair, Blair, these these are proteins that you need to remember to look for in the mix that you're going to be drinking. <laughs> but how will I remember them if I haven't been taking them? You will exercise and the exercise will help keep you young long enough to remember that you need to start Clotho. taking them before okay. you get too old. Yes. Okay. So the other, the other protein is called clusterin. Clotho and clusterin? Stop. Clotho and clusterin. <laughs> That's not real. <laughs> yes. Everybody's clusterin. Yes, I would like the clotho yep. clusterin immortality pills, please. Yes, please. Stanford researchers published in Nature today on their work looking at clusterin in mice. Now, uh, they determined that mice that exercise, exercise, exercise produce a lot of clusterin. And then when they took the clusterin from the exercise mice and gave it to lazy sedentary mice well they just weren't allowed to exercise the sedentary mice suddenly were smart like the exercise mice and so the benefits of exercise to cognition were passed along by a bunch of little there's a whole bunch of anti-inflammatory uh markers that are in the blood from these young adult fit mice Clusterin was the one that seemed to be the most important in the transfer of the abilities of the cognitive benefits to the sedentary mice. And the big thing that I thought was really uh, interesting about this study is that not only were the, the sedentary mice getting smarter, uh, they looked at the blood of veterans who had been on a multi-day, these are uh, military vet veterans that had mild cognitive impairment, six-month aerobic exercise program. At the During this, at the end of this six-month aerobic exercise program, 
these veterans had elevated cluster in in their blood. So exercise potentially is connected to increases in clusterin. Clusterin is anti-inflammatory. It also gets past the blood-brain barrier and potentially has cognitive benefits. They did not say in this study whether or not they had been able to link the increase in clusterin to cognitive improvement in these individuals with mild cognitive impairment. That hadn't been done yet. Ladies and gentlemen, exercise in a pill. <laughs> Getting sweaty at the gym, <laughs> breathing the air, and delving into the sweat of all those strangers is now a thing of the past. You can now pop a pill and get all the benefits of somebody who exercised a lot without having to do any of it. I Fantastic. was thinking more, if I exercise and take the cluster in, will I get younger? Ooh, can you get <laughs> more benefit? Be younger. Moderation. Exactly. Moderation. Yeah, and moderation. Moderation. Abusing the drug, right? <laughs> Look, here's a new drug. I want to abuse it. Can I? I want all of it. You can't have too much of a good thing. It's there science. Okay. Oh, even then. Yeah. It is science, but it's fascinating that we're able, we're, we're beginning to be able to dial in some of these factors that are involved in in aging and by understanding not only the factors so that okay maybe we can yes create an anti-aging pill or a you know multi you know a cocktail of of things that you're able to take uh but for people and but especially for people who are bedridden who are sedentary who are unable to uh to do to do movements and exercises that would be beneficial but for people who are <clears throat> excuse me, able to move, able to get out, able to uh, have exercise. And that this is not like, you know, professional athlete level exercise they're talking about. I mean, it's, it's movement. It's getting your body moving and your heart rate up for periods of time. Um, yeah. This, but this, yeah, that natural movement that our body, that it's good for our body to move. And there are some really interesting hypotheses out there about how it all feeds in together to, um, to have healthier, healthier aging, reduce inflammation, live long and prosper yeah. with clotho and yeah. cluster in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Name my, my, for my first two children, clotho and cluster in. <laughs> I, I think the whole exercise thing uh, makes sense to a certain point. Uh, throughout the history of humanity, we, we uh, persistence uh, hunters, we ran and ran and ran everywhere. We ran around the whole planet. We went everywhere. We did a lot of running. And at a certain point, though, you get to an age where you're like, eh, 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 you know, the prolonging of life is really going to be, for the, something like this, is really going to be at the end. When you, it's like running is not a thing your old, tired body wants to do anymore. Or right. is even capable of doing. Or his risk of injury becomes eh, severe to go even doing all that moving. This is a perfect time then to get those benefits uh, to counteract the what we consider natural aging effects on cognition. We're more and more learning. It's not just the date of on your uh, driver's license or the ID if you no longer are driving, but it has to do with uh, anti-inflammatories and other proteins and things running around in your blood that were being generated perhaps by exercise or eliminated or filtered out through exercise or however this is taking place. We know that young blood is working. So yeah, if we can put it in pill form, fantastic. Get rid of the yeah. exercise portion of it for when you're later in life. When you're young, you should still be doing laps. We should, no, we so should. The coach yeah, still no, I mean, whatever, there. do whatever you're able to do. Let's keep yeah. moving. We have these muscles and joints. If we can, let's use them, right? If you can. Michael Kelly, Michelle Kelly. <laughs> uh, strong muscles and brittle bones could be disastrous. That is a truth. Yeah. That's a little, yeah. 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 Oh. oh, well, um, I'm going to say that I think we've done it. 
come to the end of another show we have oh and oh i did want to say did get a letter from scott rhodes says this may have already been addressed since i'm an episode behind but i was listening to the story about vulture bees and as a beekeeper wanted to clarify something pollen and apparently meat provide a protein source for bees but the honey is made from nectar while some pollen makes its way into honey in minute amounts because it's on the bees themselves, it's stored in separate chainers than the honey and is not used directly for honey. Love the podcast. But I do need to say, I, I looked it up and vulture bees actually produce honey. It's not honey, honey. It's a mm -hmm. honey-like substance. Correct. Not yeah. derived from nectar, but from protein-rich secretions yes. of the hypopharyngeal glands. Yes. It's, it's still bee barf. And it, is, it comes from the meat. It this is, yes, I, I did additional research after this show as well, because I was also very interested in that idea yeah. of where this honey comes from. And yes, you would think that they need to get to nectar to make it, but they don't. The vulture bees do not. These vulture bees are fascinating and i also want to say thank you very much to those of you who did write in uh related to last episode's disclaimer and there were some positive comments and some educating comments and i am taking them all in and appreciate them all very very much that's a heck of a disclaimer if you got comments on it like that like, people jumped in there wow i i I think it was a pretty good one. Yeah. yeah anyway. I enjoyed, it. <laughs> I enjoyed writing it. All right. Well, we have come to the end. Thank you for that letter, Scott Rhodes. Thank you to, uh, let's see, who, Lori, who wrote in and who is somebody else? We had uh, Lori who wrote in, uh, Judy wrote in and who else did we have? Janelle and yes, a couple of other people. Thank you for your letters and thank everybody. Thank you for listening. I hope you did enjoy the show. I hope you enjoyed every little bit of it. I would like to say thank you to Fada for your help with social media, for uh, show notes. Gord, thank you for manning the chat room, keeping things clean. Identity 4 for recording the show. Thank you so much, Rachel, for your amazing assistance and helping with editing. And I would like to thank our Patreon sponsors. Thank you to Richard Badge, Kent Northcote, Pierre Valazar, Ralphie Figueroa, John Ratnaswamy, Carl Kornfeld, Karen Tazi, Woody M.S., Andre Bassett, Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vegard, Chef's Dad, Hal Snyder, Donathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, John Lee, Ali Coffin, Matty Perrin, Gaurav Sharma, Don Mundus, Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshak, Stupal and Andrew Swanson, Fred Eswanosor, Sky Luke, Paul Rodovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Jack, Brian Carrington, Matt Face, Sean and Nina Lamb, Jake, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenflow, Gene Tellier, Steve Leesman, aka Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Dana Pearson, Richard, Brendan Minish, Johnny Ridley, Kevin Railsback, Rami Dave, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, RDM, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Hey Arizona, Support, Aaron Lieberman for Governor, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Mallory Sutter, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Mountain Sloth, Jim Drapeau, Sarah Chavez, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, EO, Kevin Parachan, Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul Disney, David Summerly, Patrick Pecoraro, and Tony Steele, Ulysses Adkins, and Jason Roberts. I can't read anymore. Wow. <sighs> Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. <laughs> do, do, do. And if you would like to support Twists on Patreon, please head over to twist.org and click on the Patreon button on next week's show. We will be back Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time, Thursday, 5 a.m. Central European time, broadcasting live from our YouTube, Facebook channels and from twist.org slash live. Hey, do you want to listen to us as a podcast? Maybe while you make some delicious baked goods with your vulture bee meat honey <laughs> just search for this week in science wherever podcasts are found if you enjoyed the show get your friends to subscribe as well
For more information on anything you've heard here, uh, show notes and links to stories will be available on our website, www.twist.org. And you can also sign up for our newsletter. You can also contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at blairbaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, in the subject line, or your email will be spam filtered into my evening's clotho and cluster and cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna last a while you can also also ping us up on the twitter where we are at twist science at dr kiki at jackson fly and at blair's menagerie we love your feedback if there's a topic you'd like us to cover or address a suggestion for an interview a haiku that comes to you in the night please let us know we'll be back here next week and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news and if you've learned anything from the show, remember. It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Science is coming your way, so everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth, and I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Because it's this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 science. this week in science, this week in science. This week in science, 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news that what I say may not be. And we've come to the end of the show. It's the end. It's the after show. It's the after after show. It's the show that's after the show. It's not the before part. Mm hmm. Uh -huh. Blair's tired. We're all tired. And we're going to not eat dinner tonight in the nighttime or lunchtime in the nighttime. And uh, what was the other story that if you do, if you smoke too much weed that it is bad for your sleep? Did you see that one? No. Yeah. It, <laughs> It, okay. and it, and it can affect you by either making you have too much sleep or not enough sleep. That makes sense. So. That tracks. Yeah, it tracks. Yeah. Too much weed messes with your sleep, everybody. So, Portlanders. Kiki, <laughs> after tonight, next time I see you will be our, our, our end of year the year, year show on the 29th. The 29th. What? Okay, so you're not going to be here next week. Correct. Correct. Okay. Correct. All right. No Blair next week, everybody. What are we going to do? Excuse me. What are we going to do without you on the 15th? I don't know. With your birthday Die, in the I middle guess. there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm officially middle-aged. What? what is that? The heck does that even mean? I know. <laughs> like, what is that? <laughs> I thought you were gonna be lived to be two hundred at least. Yeah, I'm. I'm middle aged, right? I'm in the middle. We're all middle aged now. <laughs> not I'm not yet. even half. I'm now we're near halfway done. Blair, you're not allowed to grow up. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, yeah. in one month, uh. It'll be 10 years of me on the show. That's wild. It's true. Wow. Tis true. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. It is. 
Yeah, she's turning 25. That's right. <laughs> so I don't know if to be happy about that or to be offended that somebody thinks that we're only going to live to 50. <laughs> you were 15 when you started this show, though. That's, That's right. I was not. I remember we were always really like, fun. remember, we have to keep it age appropriate uh, on this show because of Blair. That's when it started. That's when we stopped cursing and talking about really adult subjects. When I came on the show and and was wearing like a mini skirt and red lipstick because I was going to the club afterwards. Yeah, I was fifteen. At fifteen? Oh my goodness! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, if you were, you would, you know, you were a child prodigy who graduated from college very young. Right. <laughs> yeah, because I graduated what? <sighs> oh. <laughs> I don't want to say. Mm. I don't want to say. <laughs> oh, yeah, no. no. I'm not, not going to do that. Yeah, I'm not going to say. Uh, Back in the last millennia. Yeah, you don't have to do to. that math. Well, oh, my. I tell you what. Back in my day. Well, like, so Brian Telephones just were back. attached to the wall. Brian just brought this back from his parents' house. And, like, I was thinking about Ooh, how. I love those. This is, like, actually a thing from my childhood. And if you tried to show a kid today this thing, they'd be like, what's the point of what this? What is going on there? But this yeah. is like an actual toy that we all enjoyed when we were young. It had yeah. the coolest uh, type of image uh, in there, too. It wasn't just, it wasn't like you were just looking at a, at a yeah, cell. Like 3D. Of a thing. Yeah. yeah, it had this sort mm -hmm. of dimensionality to it that was yep. very neat. What's her name? Whacking. In today's uh, mm -hmm. child entertainment value things, mm -hmm. there is an artist that I love who, um, oh, of course, wait, Mabs Blair's annual corner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see if I can. Mab Graves. Here we go. Mab Graves. Um, she made one of those, those viewer, those viewer things. Mm -hmm. um, and she does, her art is amazing. And she does like miniatures and felted creatures. Mm -hmm. And so she set up like all these little scenes with her art that she made, these little miniature scenes and took 3D nice. pictures of them. So it's like you click through and there are pictures of her artistic creations in 3D. It, you know, that stereo view. It's very, very cool. Mab Graves. Yeah. I recommend if you have not looked into Mab Graves, her waifs and strays. Wow, somebody's bragging. What? Chat room. I'm going to go all night. Mm. Oh, I'm going to go all <laughs> night. <laughs> night, night Fada. That was funny. That was... Blah. I love oh, Mabs. that's pretty cute stuff. Man. Yeah, look at her axolotl. Look at this guy. Mm -hmm. Look at this mm -hmm. guy. It looks so cute. Yeah, she's one of she's one of my favorites in the art world. Tanith is one of her ongoing characters. She makes these little witchy characters. Oh, yeah. You can get tape with some of her little cats. I wonder if the Etsy store has her. Invitational. All right. Uh, hey, no, no, no. great Where do show? you have to go? I got to go. I got stuff to do. I got a whole day ahead here. I, okay. I know you have a day. Okay. Okay. Up. Yeah. Yeah. I'll stop looking at Mab's stuff. I like no, Mab's stuff. Uh, but yeah. we have a next week. Blair's not going to be here. Are you going to be here next week? Yes. Yes. Okay. So no Blair plus Justin. This is the, this is the month of people and no people and people and no people. Mm -hmm. And then, um, we have a week off, so oh. everybody who's watching now, we will be taking a night off on the 22nd, but then the 29th, we will return 
with our top no. 11 <gasps> oh. of 2021 show. Year in review. Mm-hmm. Year in review. Yes. Um, will COVID make the list? <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Yes, yes, it will. <laughs> yes, it will. <laughs> it certainly no. will. No, it will. Come on. Oh gosh. Okay. Can we already? Can we just say right now that uh, on the list you can't have like COVID and then like number one, number three, the Delta variant. And yeah, no, no, no. Because no, like, no. then we could do like the whole. We never do that. We always combine things. I'm, I'm not making sure... 2021 just the different variants. No, no, <laughs> um, no, no, no. I think COVID will make the list review. somewhere because good science came out of our response to yes. the COVID pandemic. Yes, so there were important true. science stories. Optimism. So it will be on there somewhere because this is the weird optimist pessimist thing, right? Is that this is not our last pandemic, <laughs> probably even in our lifetimes. And our experience throughout this pandemic has hopefully helped inform our response to future pandemics. So 2021 on it. The year we thought it was over. Mm-hmm. Mm. But it wasn't. Mm-mm. But it kept going. We were still doing things. Mm-hmm. And pretending that it wasn't over, even though it was over. Yeah. 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 Uh, Yeah. So we will need to schedule a time in the next weeks for all of us to connect and talk about our stories that we think are the top stories. So everyone who's watching, you can uh, use the hashtag top 11 science. Mm-hmm. Or top eleven. Wait, no, you can't. Or wait, we gotta have one. We gotta, we gotta we can't switch. Well, it. our hashtag. Yeah, like okay, 11. here's five hashtags. You can't do give multiple hashtags. The whole point of a hashtag <laughs> is you send people to one place. What have we used before? Top eleven, or I think it was twist top eleven. But I'm not... we've used top eleven science. That's what we've done. Top oh, eleven okay. science. We also had Twist Top 11. Yes. Yeah, we have done Twist Top 11. Yeah. We've done both. I'm looking. Yeah. Oh, boy. Top 11 science. Going back to 2015 there. So I'm that looking. one, for sure. In 2020, we had Top 11, hashtag Top 11 science. Top 11 science trends of 2019. Top 11 science countdown for 2016. I think top 11 science is the hashtag mm-hmm. that I forget every year. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Twist top 11 will work work as well. Dan Christensen, that hashtag is not, that's confusing. <laughs> number one. Oh, are you saying the word number one? I like that hashtag. <laughs> I like this hashtag there. Number one. Right? Is that what Twist that is? Twist one. <laughs> Twist one. Yes. Love it. Hashtags. Getting a hashtags. Uh, yes, let us know. You can send emails to let us know what stories you think were the top stories of the year. We have tried in the past to just choose individual stories, but there's just so many. We end up lumping them into categories of mm-hmm. top 11 categories every year. I don't know. Maybe we'll change it and just make it easy on us and do certainly could individual stories. We could, we could, we could. it would be a very short show. <laughs> would it? I don't know. I don't know. Can we do a short show with the three of us? I don't know about that, especially the end of the year. I don't know about that. Can't believe we're so close. So close to the end of this year. 2022 is on its way. Amazing. Y'all ready to go? Yeah. Yeah. Say, Say good morning, Justin. 
Good morning, Justin. Say good night, Blair. Good night, Blair. Good, good night. night, Kiki. Kiki. Good night, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. We will see you again next week. And in case, in case you need a little bit more entertainment, I'm going to be talking science of the fly uh, with Scott Sigler on his Monster of the Week live stream on Friday, 4 p.m. Pacific time. We're going to be talking about the Brundle fly. That's fun. Monster That's gross, actually. Very gross. Very gross. But, you know, maybe, uh, maybe we won't talk about genetics or, you know, genetic modification or anything like that. Maybe we'll talk about fly feeding habits. Mm -hmm. Fly biology mm -hmm. and ecology. Yes. Uh, I will share links on Twitter and all that kind of stuff. Stay, stay well. Stay happy. Well, do what you can to do what you do. And we do hope that we will see you again next week. Stay safe. Stay curious. Thank you for joining us. Good night.